I know, I, can, I hate the mics. Um, hey, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I hope that you'll get your money's worth today. It's a little bit smaller audience than we sometimes have at our GCBX events, and I think that's great. What I think we're going to do today is have a, an awesome presentation, but involve each of you with the questions and concerns that you brought here about cyber liability. Now, before we get started, I want to tell you what this means to me. And, and I think it's probably similar to each of you. Um, I've been in town here for 16 years or so. I started as a commercial banker for SunTrust, and then about 10 years ago, I signed on with Rob at Atlas. Um, in my career, I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of people's really personal financial information. I know who your clients are. Uh, I know what they pay you. I know what you pay for your suppliers and your subcontractors. I've been given, in a lot of cases, the keys to the kingdom. And I thought for my entire career that to be successful at my job, the only thing I would really need to know how to do is keep my mouth shut. I'd need to be able to sit with two people, both clients, knowing everything about each of you, but not letting either of you know that I know that. And so far in my career, I've done a great job of that. I've been successful and grown and, and have, have a great book of business to be proud of. But today the threat is a little different. Uh, today the threat comes not from Billy having too many beers at the bar and saying the wrong thing, but from the dark web, something that, I don't even know what that is. That feels like to me it's from a comic book somewhere, like there should be a superhero in a cape that flies through the dark web and saves the day. And so I know that sounds a little silly, but my business has changed. In, in the last 10 years, the threats from the cyber side have, have more than doubled. And I think of the business that I'm in and the risks that are there, and of all the, the lines of businesses we write, cyber liability is one that I think will only continue to grow through my career. So for today, what we've set up is a seminar where we've got a, a, a representative business owner in, in David and a, and a great technician in Nathan. And, and what we want to do is have some dialogue back and forth where there's some questions and some answers and some content that each of you leave here with like an actionable item, something that you go back to your office and change. And if nothing else, you've got a great takeaway that you throw in your desk drawer that when that attack does happen and it's that oh, kind of moment, you open the drawer and you look at the playbook and you decide what to do next. So with that, I want Amy from Wright Technology to come. She's our presenting sponsor. She's going to give you a few words on her and her company, and then we have a great presentation in store for you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I don't need a microphone, do I? Normally I'm told I'm too loud, so let's see. Can you hear me? Um, so I'm Amy from Wright Technology. We've been a member for, of GBC, GCBX for a while, but I'm really excited because we have decided to become a platinum sponsor. And we did that because this is one of my favorite networking groups um, because I feel that the members are so loyal. And I also think we get a lot out of Mary and her leadership because it's such a forward-looking organization that not only keeps us up to date with what's going on in the commercial construction industry, but also gives us a voice. So I'm thrilled and excited about that. So hopefully you'll see us sponsoring a lot of things. Um, Bright Technology has been in business here in the Manatee and Sarasota area for 30 years. We help companies with office technology, not anything like South Tech does. We work with document workflow. So copiers and printers and managed print service, but we also help companies become paperless. So if that is something you're interested in, definitely talk to us. We also help um, make meetings less painful. So for you masochists who enjoy meetings, we can't help you. But we have video conferencing technology and video conferencing software that makes all of the pains of the technology of video conferencing a lot simpler. So we're here. Um, you'll see lots of me. And I also, I, I know it's uh, David and Jared are speaking as well, but I have to say a little bit about South Tech because they've been such incredible partners to us for a long time, decades. I asked people in my company, they couldn't remember when we first started partnering, so it's definitely 20 years. And uh, the reason we work so well with South Tech is because they culturally mirror us. And that I know if I send a client to them with, for things that are usually overwhelming, like IT, they're going to speak to them in plain English and make the very overwhelming seem simpler. So I'm thrilled about that. And Nathan, I know you have helped David and uh, Jared here, but I just needed to say a little bit. And that's it. Thanks so much for having us.
So really what it does, and, and the playbook is going to be very effective for you more so than me speaking today, because it gives you the steps to do what we would recommend to any business, uh, specifically contractors in this case, in order to really make sure you're ready for what we see today. And, and it walks through uh, identifying, then protecting, uh, then detecting, and then when you have an event, uh, responding and then recovering. So we'll go through each one of those, um, but that's what the NIST is. And if you went out there and looked on the website, my goodness, it's thousands of pages. The examples are endless. It's exhausting. Uh, our company goes through some annual audits, and what we're trying to do is bring this down to, to the, our client's level to, to uh, layman's terms like Amy talked about. I'm not a deep technician, but we want our clients to understand what our technical team can provide and what we have to do. So let's dive right in, identify. So step one, and, and we usually see this is not done, it's done in businesses. Everybody here is familiar with risk management. You're in construction or related to it in some way. Uh, you live in that world, but what we highly recommend and what you'll see is that when you do a risk assessment annually, that there is a very large component related to IT and information. Um, we've met with some clients that we've taken on as an example in the years, and they didn't know what information they were capturing and where they were saving that. So um, when you think of your construction documents, when you share stuff with your subs, or if you are a subcontractor with the GCs, where are you storing that online? What information are you gathering? What kind of risk is associated with that? I mean, that's, that's identify step one, is to, to make IT part of your risk assessment. And everybody does a risk assessment, assessment to some degree. You, you essentially decide what you're gonna focus on. Um, but in the playbook, if you really sit down with all of your department heads, all the areas of your business, and talk about where the information is, what data you're capturing, and what technology is used. So, so with you as a consultant, how many of your clients had really um, egregious risks that they weren't aware of, like as a general kind of percentage? I mean, does a lot of us have it, or is it really rare? I think nowadays, everyone has it. It's 
to what degree, and that usually depends on what industry you're in, what kind of information you're gathering. Um, everything from credit card numbers, social security numbers, names, addresses, uh, healthcare information. Um, but in the construction, then it's, it's the people you're related to, uh, the documents you share with them. Um, I, I would argue that most small, medium-sized companies up until the last couple of years haven't been doing it at all. They really have. Um, we, we sort of at times even force our clients to go through it. Um, we, we sit down with them, we require that we do it um, at least annually. And the reason for that is, is for us, our risk management. When we, when we do a risk assessment with South Tech, um, one of the biggest things that's impacted in these events is reputation, right? And so if our clients have an event of some type, South Tech's reputation will be immediately on the line, right? If they're a client of ours and we're doing all that we can to protect them, and, and something happens, then, then we kind of look bad as well. So as part of what we do, we sit down with every company and, and walk them through that and, and sort of prod to find out, okay, well, how are you doing this? And, oh, we didn't know you were doing that. We didn't know you opened a Dropbox account. We didn't know you were using OneDrive now. Is that a personal one? Is it a business one? What permissions are you setting up? Who are you inviting to those folders? And uh, through the years, uh, sales teams save stuff everywhere as they travel. So, so the short answer is, very few companies um, that are in the small, medium-sized space do it because there's a cost associated, there's processes that are not with. But you're seeing more and more of it, I and mean, more and more companies are doing it. So I, I don't know if you all remember, but five or six years ago, the uh, city of Sarasota, I think it was, had a big problem, and you know, I think it was the city being reactive, and is that really what you're saying? Is that we all are yeah. reactive, we don't necessarily look for a problem until one happens to us, and then we like say, oh my gosh, we had all those problems. Yeah, so, so about a month ago, very similar to that, a, a city in Colorado uh, wired approximately a little bit over a million dollars um, to a bridge contractor that was building the bridge. Only they didn't send it to the bridge contractor. They sent it to a third party that had got the city to change the, the pay instructions, the wire instructions. And the way they did that, so if you think about identifying risk, the way, that, the way that the company, or this, this bad actor, got the company to, the city to wire the company money somewhere else, was they, they had on their website um, a way to actually go in and change the pay instructions, right? So you could log on to the website, or I'm sorry, not even log on, you could go to the website and you could say, hey, here's the company, I'm doing this contract, our bank information changed. It was really that simple. Now, the city did have processes in place, right? that after someone filled in that information, that employees were to do some due diligence, take some steps to make sure it was accurate. And all that happened is one employee didn't do their job, and a, a million dollars went to a US account, and then went offshore, and it was gone. And um, the risk that they should have identified in step one is that they had a portal on their website where you could literally change wire instructions for banking <coughs> and then if people did that, it was reliance on one employee to make sure that they followed up and did everything. And that's a huge risk they didn't identify, and then they compounded it because of the procedures and processes for a little while, which we'll talk about next. But it's important that you really think um, across the whole company, right? We hear a lot about, we got IT security down, we've got our antivirus, we've got our firewall, we're good. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is information and data that you're storing everywhere. And then yes, it's supposed to be protected with technology, but you have to take a broader look across all departments. So, so what are the different components of protecting the business? Yes, so layered security is what we like to preach. Um, protect is probably where most people start to think of when they think of cybersecurity and IT. What are we doing to protect our information? Well, first, identify all of it. People often miss. But then when you protect, take a layered approach. Um, you do want a firewall, you do want antivirus, those are the obvious ones. Um, you want to put uh, scanning systems in place that will maybe detect anomalies. Uh, you can take this pretty far, you can buy some very expensive softwares um, that one will protect your network from intrusion, but then start to detect things on your network that are anomalies. Um, but, but I would say, so a layered security, right? As many different layers as you can put in place, and that's in the playbook as to which ones specifically you could get into. But the, you know, I sat through a presentation at the FBI about um, 
three months ago, and, and really what they talked about, and everybody put their hand up that they're nervous about it, and they literally told us over and over in this whole room of national IT companies that um, everybody could be happy. The guy giving the presentation started a company, he used to work for the government, and his job was to hack into other countries. And he did it very well, from what I could tell. And then in his presentation, he put up photos of him and the presidents over the last 12 years where he was receiving awards for being good at this. And what he said is that you can get into anything. The goal is to make yourself a hard target so they move on to the next person or the next company. So layered security does that. Right? When you're protecting your network, are you making it perfect? Are we South Tech? No. But if you put enough layers there, um, these are businesses that are trying to get your information. It is a profit-making machine. And we all talk about return on investment. Well, the more time they have to spend trying to get into your information, the lower the return on investment is, and they, and they move on more often. At least that's what the FBI was saying they see in, in this gentleman. So layered security is, is really the answer. Um, having one or two things in place doesn't work. So let me talk about the biggest layer that we think is being missed. Um, the employee training, the human. Uh, you can put as much security in place as you want right now, and all it does is, is get you so far, but if you have users, employees, management, uh, executive level, that are unaware of how to operate properly within this environment, they unlock all of those layers that you put in place through their actions. And I would say right now that is the number one uh, thing that we're seeing across the industry is, is the human error and, and you need to make sure that your teams are adequately trained. Um, and that's a big layer. So I think all my people are now conditioned not to respond to the guy in Zimbabwe who has discovered a, a will that names them as a beneficiary. Um, by the way, how many of you all train your people or get trained in dealing with your IT systems? With your IT systems, with your computer systems, email, all that. Everybody gets some level of training. I feel like we do a pretty good job of training our people, but I keep getting calls from employees saying, did you really just send me an email asking me to send you gift cards, go to Walmart and buy gift cards for me? And Despite what I think is good training, it still is happening with targeted people who have my email address, my name, maybe my old logo version on an email from me saying, hey, I need your help today. What does good training mean? Good training is, is ongoing, is, is what I would say. Um, everybody should do some initial training related to the IT systems of every business when they start. But I think good training has to be real world, adaptive, and ongoing. Because the people on the other end are, are rapidly advancing their techniques and their approach. Um, everybody's familiar with the, the blanket emails. Everybody's familiar with ransomware. Well, guess what we're not seeing very much of any of that. We don't see ransomware that much. Or it locks up the server. Yeah, that might happen. Um, but what we're seeing much, much more is uh, the events where they get to an employee. This is probably the most common one that is growing. And everybody's heard of it, so, so, but maybe some of you haven't. So let me walk through it. Uh, a, an employee gets an email and uh, has some attachment link or something, and it looks incredibly good. It's not somebody from a foreign country asking to be released from prison because they're a prince and they have millions. It's, it's literally something related to your life because Jared wrote down all your information and now he's got it, right? So they send it to you and it's very strategic. You click on it, it takes you to a site that says, hey, you need to, in order to open it, you gotta put in your Office 365 credentials. And you put those in and it all looks all normal and maybe you even get an error message, you're like, oh, that didn't work, you tried to do it again, but now they have your login immediately. And they don't even break your computer, they try to make it look like nothing happened and you're moving on with your day and you, you get your next email and move on. And they immediately are logging into your Office 365 and they are sitting in your email account and they are just waiting and watching and reading. And they'll typically set up rules to forward your emails out of your Office 365 or Gmail, whatever account they just got into, because they're all susceptible to the same approach, and they'll forward that to another email account, and they sit there, and they sit there a long time, and they look through all of your information to figure out how they can get a return. And then, um, if it might be wire instructions, if you're a contractor and you're the uh, CFO, um, it might be <coughs> you're buying a home, and it's the closing payment, 
Um, we've seen all of these, and they'll wait and intercept your emails, and they'll grab the signatures of your attorneys, uh, the GC, whoever they need, and they'll build incredibly well-written emails, right? There's no grammar mistakes anymore. They're using the same tools we do every day. And um, they'll intercept that, and they'll send the wire instructions. They'll say, I'm stepping into a meeting for the closing today or for the payment this is what happened in Colorado. Send the money here. Uh, you won't be able to reach me for the next couple hours. I'm going to meet. And they put it all in email and they send it. And that is the number one thing going on right now in the industry. If you go Google that and read it, at the business um, email compromise is what they call it, the BEC. And it is rapidly accelerating. It's very strategic. And everybody's like, well, how does this happen to me? Well, our emails are everywhere. We put them on our websites or on LinkedIn or everywhere so that people can get a hold of us because it's good networking. And then they just build an incredibly good case in one email, get you to click on it, get you to put your credentials in, and then just watch you until they can figure out what to do. Um, so one, be aware of that, but when you talk about training, if you took training two years ago and it said don't download ransomware, you're not going to catch that when you hit the link and it takes you to a splash page and it says put in your credentials. You should never be doing that. You might do it. And um, training's got to be consistent. But the human layer, when you think about some of the things I just walked through, uh, that's happening at a rapid pace. I would argue all the time. I get them. I don't know. If, put a hand up if you've ever gotten one of those emails and you actually caught it and you're like, that's not right. Well, good for you. So you guys are, are catching them. But they get better and better, right? And so the training that we do with our clients and internally um, is we try to trick them constantly. There's tools and programs in place that we send them to training and then we try to trick people every single month. And, it, and admittedly, in the past year, I clicked on one. Um, it was on my phone. It was harder not to click because you're just touching everything. And now I hit, and I knew immediately because you hit it, it takes you to the page, and the model would be like, wah, 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 right? I mean, and here I'm one of the top people at South Tech, I'm not supposed to, but I hit it from a phone because I was just flipping through hundreds of emails really quick and hit it, and that's all it takes. Yeah, I hit it one time when it was uh, Adobe Acrobat update. Oh yeah. And it was Adobe logo, and it was when I was opening an Acrobat file, I had no idea that it wasn't legit. And as soon as I did it, I said, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, because the, the, the email or the address that it sent me to was slightly obscured, like I said that it wasn't, yeah. Adobe, it wasn't Adobe. So a virus got it, and that was, that was like probably eight or nine years ago now. I don't think they're still doing that. Yeah. No. No, typically you'd hit it. So I got one the other day, last week, um, that was a real one. Uh, somebody's email had been compromised that I know. <coughs> We've all gotten these, and they sent one, and it was really well written, and it had an invoice, and it was a PDF attached to it, um, and said, hey, here's, and we do business with them, and, and it said, here's your bill, a very succinct, well written, <coughs> like come from an accounting department, nothing extra, um, but just enough. And, uh, and, it, and it, as you looked at it, would take you to one of those pages. It wouldn't download a virus. It would take you to a page where you're going to put in your credentials. So training has to be ongoing. But that's the, that, that human layer of security is probably one of the most important that IT departments can't really control all the time. It has to come from the executives to enforce it, to require it, to keep it going. And that's the challenge we see is that you can educate your IT department that, hey, we need, we need security training. Got it. We'll do that once a year. We'll talk about what's going on. Well, technology changes so fast, the second half of the year, you're going to run over. Yeah. So it's important that all managers, all departments, really address it on board. Right. So, so we've got our protection in place. We've trained all our people. And we're just waiting to get attacked, right? So how do we know when it happens? Again, it's ongoing every day, right? So they just keep looking and pinging and hitting your servers and looking through your accounts and trying. Um, so once they're in there, so, so detection it can come in many layers once they get in. And, and people, we've already talked about it, how eventually it's going to happen to everybody. It really does. Um, it's a numbers game. Make yourself a hard target. But what, let's say someone's in there. Um, you can implement. Now, now, there's different flavors and layers of this, and, and money comes into play. But you can implement systems at a basic level that detect anomalies on your network, um, moving large amounts of files, applications running that really don't do anything, they're just running and you're sitting there and you're like, well, what's that? Um, so you can pay for what are called uh, security event incident management systems, seem that, that'll uh, really help you with that and send alerts and notifications, but those can be expensive <coughs> at times, right? So you gotta look at what your return's gonna be, what your risk thresholds are. 
Um, if you take the email example, some of these systems now will let you write uh, email rules or, or detection alerts so that if someone was to get into an email account, uh, it will notify the IT department if a new rule is set up within their outlook. Because usually what they do is they get in your email, they don't physically read them, they're forwarding them all out of your system to their email. There's a rule running in the background. Every email I get, forward it out to my Gmail account. So you don't know they're there and they're just reading it in Gmail. But you can set up systems, you can pay for security systems with NIT that would tell you every time a new rule is written. Right? And so within South Tech we run that. And if I set up a new rule in my outlook, Chad, our CTO is immediately going to reach out to me. It's happened a couple times. He's like, did you set up a new rule? Because you've got another one in your outlook. Um, so when you think of detection, stuff like that, looking for anomalies, looking for behaviors that don't look right, um, and you can get pretty deep, you can even implement systems that look at the way emails are typed <coughs> from that specific user, and it compares it to their previous, and it's looking at how they write, and it actually figures that out. But again, each of them has a different cost point and what level to be at. Can you check your own Outlook rules? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's very easy to go into your Outlook rules and see exactly what they've done. We see it all the time. The rules will, will look something like a forward. Then once they figure out who the key players are, they'll say, hey, um, not, don't just send me every email, but now specifically when I get them from David, send me a copy, quickly delete it. Right? So before they weren't deleting it because they're just, they don't want you to know they're there. But once they're there and they know that you're a key player and can approve a payment, and you typically send notice to the controller to issue even a $5,000 check monthly on something, they're like, perfect, let's wait till it's a bit bigger, and now I'm gonna write a rule that says every time David sends an email to this person and it has payment approved or this word in it, um, of course keep forwarding to me, but now I want you to delete it so the controller never sees it. And then they write their own email, copying what you wrote, writing in different instructions, but you can go look at those rules to answer your question. They're there in Outlook. You'll see them um, so far. I'm sure it's coming where somehow they'll start to manipulate them in the back end. But right now, the sophistication is in that front end piece, and then they're just sending offline. And then the emails they write, my goodness, they're good. Right, the, the, the email comes from the CEO, goes to the CFO, goes to the controller, and then it's just the AP. And those three look so good, the signature blocks, the emails, what were written. By the time it gets to the fourth person, you think that they're checking to make sure they're allowed to issue payment. If everyone in the company that approves payment's already on there, they don't. But they should. When you think about a process and detecting, you should have a verbal confirmation for payment changes. Like That's really the best way to do it right now, is to get requests and then call and confirm. So. In the playbook, it talks about monitoring the dark web to see anomalies in, in behavior. And, uh, you know, Amy in the beginning said something about what's the dark web. I, I don't know. What's the dark web? Yeah, you know, I don't know that I fully understand it's the truth. But it's the internet we don't see, right? It's, it's where it's the black market of the internet. So just think of it that way, right? It's very high tech, but it's really um, the black market. And we've had experience with this. So the FBI has literally reached out to us before and said, hey, we need to talk to you some information on the dark web related to this company, and we've had to go through a process with them. Again, nothing done wrong by the client or us. Um, it just happens, and it's, and it's going to happen. But you can monitor the dark web. Again, you can, you can put services in place that it'll look and constantly be combing to see is Nate's email out there. And if my email is out there, that's my login, right? So they're looking for my logins that people are going to buy, and my password would be with it, right? So it, it, it's looking through to look at for common occurrences. In the software, what it does is you tell it all of the stuff you use, like um, the, the application that we're gonna have scan. I tell it all my logins, this is my email addresses I use, my, my home ones, and then it's just combing the dark web for those to see any occurrences where they pop up, maybe social security, things like that. Um, but it's essentially the place that, that people will go and literally execute transactions to buy data. A lot of healthcare data these days. Um, in the construction, I don't see a ton of that, um, is the truth on dark web, because most of, of the way that I've seen getting to contractors is getting into emails and trying to, to manipulate payment methods and things like that, or ransomware. We still do see that where it locks up a whole computer and they're demanding the ransom. Yeah. Any questions on the dark web? If so, I'm gonna have to field those and respond later. <laughs> I had a question that came up when we were uh, putting it on. Like, um, it seems like two or three years ago that if somebody would hack your system and lock it up, the ransom would be like, okay, like, 
give me a ten dollar Starbucks gift card and I'll unlock it. And now when you talk to underwriters and people from the insurance side, they regularly see those in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm trying to figure out why it's different today than it was I think two things. I think one, um, <coughs> they've gotten, they're just more sophisticated in everything they do. Um, sitting through that presentation by the former FBI agent, he talked about how their businesses that are doing this are just even more advanced than ours. Um, they had recordings that they displayed and showed how um, they'll set traps for, for the folks that are coming in and then they record them and they use them in their training and they're recording the screens and the back end so that you can see what the bad actors are doing so they can say, see, look how they operate. This is what they're doing. They look like the technician that's out there. They're very good on computers. They're smart, they're moving through it. It's a career for them. And they're using password managers just like we do, right? So they have good security. The hackers are very responsible and as they leave their trails, they're making sure their passwords are good. It's, it's very much big business and I think they've gotten more sophisticated and it used to be blanket type emails and blanket uh, encryption and they were automated. And so you would see, hey, you've got ransomware at $200. Somebody else said ransomware at $200 and they're all the same because it was the application doing it. They weren't being very strategic, it was more broad, broad based. And it's, it, this is one of the reasons I think anyway, and as it's gotten more strategic, they, they hit one of those hospitals like you see in the news or a government, they know that they don't have a $200 target. They're like, uh, they manipulate the application, they know that they were, they were trying to get into that business with ransomware, not just trying all of them. And so by the time someone hits it there, the ransom is just much higher. That in Bitcoins, they're, they're tied to Bitcoins and I, I, with the huge rapid increase in Bitcoins, a lot of the software said two Bitcoins. Well, that instantly turned into more money, the more it went up, yeah. right? And it might've still just said two Bitcoins, but the conversion rate turned into much higher dollars. And so Again, but those are the automated ones. So if it just said Bitcoins, you're like, well, why is it more money? Like, it's still it's still 10 Bitcoins, but the Bitcoins are just so much more valuable that it's hugely cost prohibitive. But a lot of it's strategic too. But I think it's those two reasons. Not for sure. You know, it's hard to know how they up their ransom. In the back. the presence of 5G networks makes a difference now too. Is that true? I, I don't know. Truth be told, off my head, I could ask one of the engineers, one of my smarter folks. I don't know much about it. I just heard that it like speeds things up. And it's going to um, it's going to connect us all great, right? And we're going to have in increased mobility, speed, everything. But it's going to open a whole other can of worms. Absolutely, yeah. The faster you can move data and stuff like that, the people can get away with more. But again, a lot of what we're seeing is very electronic. Just a, just a point on all these wire issues that are going on in payments and automatic payments. Um, you can't always recover from them, and we're going to talk about recovery in the pat in, in the next couple steps here. Um, but if you give the instructions to wire money somewhere, you basically gave them the money. You did it. There was no sort of bank robbery or, or it, it's hard for you to go back to your bank and say, hey, I just wired $100,000 to the wrong spot. There was a story on NPR a couple months ago and it was in small business and the gentleman was sending a distribution to his partner for the quarterly uh, or annual profits of the company or for the tax payment. And his partner had been compromised and it was only 50 grand, but, but when you're a, 10 person company, that's a lot of money. And this bank's like, sorry, you literally gave the wire instructions away to that person and they wired the money. Like all everything, they did it. Right? Yeah. And if you do it wrong, his brother gave him different wire instructions. He executed the wire to a real bank in the US. That bank, before they could figure out it was gone, took it offshore and it was gone. Um, and that's happening a lot. Like if the recovery is tough unless you can really prove that there was some sort of compromise related to a cyber event. And you, that's why the human training is so important because if you just do it all yourself, you might actually have an issue with, with you being liable for it because it wasn't like someone stole a credit card number and used it. Yeah, so we skipped over the, uh, the response uh, step and yes. you were talking earlier about the FBI, uh, former FBI agent making presentation. And I think we all saw in the news last year, the year before about uh, Craigslist had the FBI come in and shut down part of their services uh, section of their site. Is the government really t protecting us on this stuff? Or how, how do we actually, as business owners, respond to a threat? I mean, do we call the FBI? What do we do? Yeah. So, good question. So if you think about all the steps, um, responding is one that typically doesn't get the attention that it should. It's similar to identify up front almost that risk assessment. 
I recommend everybody, and it seems really weird because maybe nothing's happened yet, but you really should have a playbook and plan for when it happens. It's happening that often now. Um, a good if you have an injury on a job site right now, does everyone sort of have a, a safety plan and what they do after that happens? Right. Probably, let's say it's a severe accident. Do you have a plan in place of what you would tell to the news, to OSHA, whatever, right? A lot of stuff that contractors typically go through. Do you have a plan for when your IT gets compromised and you either are down for <coughs> multiple days because you weren't ready or the information is broadcast or the FBI shows up? Do you have a plan for how you're going to respond both communication-wise and actually logistically? And most companies don't yet. They don't, it's painful. We go through it annually. I really don't enjoy the process because we have to actually test it, send people off-site. Can we operate different ways? It's exhausting. But the truth is, someday that will matter. And um, you've got to have a good plan in order to, to uh, respond. So, so the response is, is different than recovery. Recovery is get back on your feet. Response is what do we truly do in the midst of the fire? What's our PR strategy? What are we telling people? How do we contact our clients? How do we do that effectively, quickly, without creating a panic? Um, like really, what are, these, what are the employees supposed to do if they discover it? And if you don't have that, plan in place to respond effectively. What happens is um, it takes way longer than it should. It's very disorganized. It starts to reveal that, that you weren't prepared. Um, and then people start to think it's your fault, right? Like if you're, if you're not very put together after an event, they're gonna think that you really didn't do anything to prevent the event, is what I, in, in my experience. However, if something happens and you're like, this is what happened, this is how we're responding to it, this is what we're going to be doing, even if you haven't done anything, you're just explaining the plan and what the steps will be, your reputation will be better, your confidence level will be better for people around yourself. And, and to me, that's response. It's knowing how you're going to, in the moment, react to an incident. At South Tech, we probably see different security incidents um, multiple times a month, maybe once a week, different levels, but with human error, people are clicking on that stuff all the time. We have that down. I don't want people walking in my office and saying, what do I do, this event just occurred. It's too late. <laughs> if, if they walked in my office and asked that, then I failed. They don't know what they're supposed to do. We live in that industry. We have templated checklists, process, communication, and to some degree, every contractor should too, because it is going to happen. You don't know when, and you, and if you're not a, let's say you're the one in charge all that, what if you're on vacation that week? It's gonna step into that process. It's gonna be embarrassing. Look at that city in Colorado. Look at the hospitals going. It's never a good PR day. So you better be as prepared as possible. And you're respond. So let's assume we have a, have a response and we stopped at an event midstream. Uh, I had an event probably uh, 11 years ago now multiple servers and a disgruntled employee had one of the other employees passwords and was just being malicious just deleting files and we had redundant backups and stuff and, and found that even after it was all restored and we recovered the data it still wasn't quite the same you know we still had issues with searching and indexing and trying to find the right stuff and having little, little yeah. nuances that change because the backups are only so good um, what do we have to do to be safe? I know technology's evolved over the last 11 years, and I'm more confident today than I was back then, but you know, how much practice do we really have to, like once a year, once a quarter, when should we like maybe flip the switch and say, oops, let's make sure this yes. is down. So, so back to your question on the does the FBI really protect us? In our experience, no. So you better be ready for this to, to recover this final step because, and they kind of said that, it's very similar. My truck got broken into in our, my driveway or so ago, and they came out and fingerprinted it, so that was very impressive, right? Dusted it down, all this stuff, and I met a detective, it was very important, I had a case, I had to follow up, called the sheriff a couple times, um, you think they found anything, they got anywhere, and I asked the guy, I was like, after he left, and he'd done all this, he's like, are you, really, are you gonna be able to help, and he's like, no, absolutely not, he's like, you're, 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 whatever got stolen, he's like, you might as well move on with your life, he didn't say it like that, but he was just like, you're crazy, we're not gonna spend time on that. And they don't. And the FBI, in the one event that we had, where we had a client had stuff on the dark web that we helped um, work with, is very similar. They're like, look, we're not gonna catch the people. We just wanted to tell you. 
right? And you need to do things and take steps in your respond and recover process. But I don't think they've caught those people. Now, we, we have, we're involved in an incident where they caught some of the people in the US getting the money out of a bank after it had been wired. But those really aren't the people behind it, the masterminds, so to speak. Those are the people just picking up the money. Um, but what they're really trying to do now is have you wired to US and go outside. So the FBI doesn't protect. But then when you think about what do we have to do to truly recover when you have an event, if your servers are compromised, um, multiple things, backups being the biggest. And, and there are now, it sounds like you had an experience where you might have had file level backup or just pieces having to be restored. And trying to build that picture again can be very hard if it's, if it's piecemeal. Uh, the, you know, fast forward, in, in most backup systems that are best in class now are taking snapshots of the entire server. So that if you go back to a state in time, you're not just pulling data, and files, and folder structure, you're pulling the whole server. So, so typically, the user experience is better that way because everything operates the same way it did back then. Um, but you need to have really good backups. And, and then another thing related to some of the stuff we talked about, if you think about the event that David was just explaining, someone's deleting folders, files, uh, maybe they're downloading a ton of data. Um, those systems that you put in place to detect anomalies, those are the types of things that they start to pick up on. Because they watch your network from a normal state, and you know, Eric Troyer and he works at KB, and he's usually using these folders and files, and he uses them all the time, and, he, and these are the clients he works on, and then one day Eric comes in and downloads a bunch of stuff from over here, or just copies it, or starts opening it. It might be perfectly okay, but those systems would actually look at it and say, that's not normal, even if it is okay, let me tell somebody. And you can put stuff like that in place. It costs money, of course, but but one, you can kind of detect that. Two, the backups these days are better. You, sh you should have a good best in class. When people are just backing up their folders and file structure, you have a risk of some business continuity issues if you're not doing the whole server because of things like that now. So as far as cost goes, you know, there's what Jared was talking about earlier. There's insurance now for cyber stuff. What's covered? I mean, is is being reactive and the cost for your consultant to restore your server, you have to buy new servers, is that covered? Is it just the ransomware? What does the insurance do for us? Yep, so backups being a key point of recovery and then cyber insurance, right? So cyber insurance should have come up hopefully when you were in the, um, essentially the identify risk right at the beginning. Uh, it's part of your response and recover plan. Um, we are seeing this everywhere now. You should be looking at cyber insurance. The amount of coverage always comes up and, and that's hard to determine based on risk tolerance and what you're specifically doing, but you should review that with your providers. What we do at South Tech to help with that is, is we'll typically help answer the questions related to what are your security pieces of your IT and, and what are your processes and are you training the employees. So we'll help uh, make sure the application is accurate based upon what's being done for the services we provide. But you should go over your risk tolerance to look at that. But in, um, we've had some events where um, a company came to us and they had gotten ransomware um, like three times over the course of like four months, right? Almost, I would argue this is, this is walking the line of putting them out of business now. Their clients are noticing, it's impacting everything. So they come to us for help, they weren't a client at the time. And um, they had cyber insurance though. And, and, and from what I could tell, I wasn't involved in those discussions, but pretty good policy and it actually helped uh, cover the cost of recovering the, the time that we had stepped in putting new systems in place, uh, paying for consultants. Um, one thing that people always ask South Tech is, can you help us in these events related to the criminal aspect? And um, we don't, we, 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 because we do the IT, we work with third party forensic IT companies that will step in. And if you have an event, it's very important that you uh, don't start messing with the computer to solve the problem yourself. You have to maintain a chain of custody with those devices if you're gonna use it in a criminal case a civil case, I would argue. Because if you, even South Tech, if we step into our, if our client has an event and we, and we know this is gonna end up being criminal to some degree or something, they're gonna need a court, you really wanna get a forensic IT company involved that can document the chain of custody so that they know that you didn't manipulate evidence. So, um, you know, things like that, you gotta make sure that you, in, your, in your response and recovery that you have those things in place so that you don't inadvertently in trying to help make it so that you can't you know, go to your cyber insurance and say, well, we've got the computer, we've got the chain of custody, here's what happened. But in this case with our client, they had that, we got them in touch with the right company and, and their policy stepped in and really helped them get things back on track. Yeah, at the committee meeting, you were saying some of the managers and, and employees didn't want 
others in the company know they've been spending half the day on Facebook or something, so they went ahead and hit the delete button and, and tried to cover up whatever they did wrong. You right. Know? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like if, if you're the end user and you click on something and you compromise your account and heaven forbid the whole company, yeah, you immediately, human nature, you're defensive, you're, they're gonna try to start covering stuff up and you might actually make it worse if you haven't trained the employee that now we can't take this uh, to our insurance because it's all just been torn up. It's evidence, it's, it's just like when they collect physical evidence. Yeah, so a big part of the plan. So that, that's the, the basic framework. Um, is there any anything about the nuances of this that we haven't touched on that you guys are interested in? We still have a few more minutes left. Yeah, I saw that question. Yeah. And then, what would you say the average percent of the total budget should be spent on IT in a small company? Good question. Good question. Yeah. The total budget. You know, a like if our budget is three percent, what's your IT budget? My um, my sales manager in the back just put his thumb in. Right <laughs> How funny is that, right? <laughs> Um, man, that's a good question. Uh, I, I honestly would probably want to look that up before I would guess because I think it varies by industry. Um, our healthcare clients should be spending probably more because of what risk they take on. Um, their whole industry is built on capture a bunch of information you're not supposed to have, right? And then they got to protect it. Um, it would probably be less than a contractor than a healthcare. But I, I would argue, as my sales manager is probably trying to indicate, that most companies um, still view IT, unfortunately, as a utility, um, right? You're trying to save money on IT, not invest in it. And, and it makes sense. I mean, we all kind of think of it that way uh, initially. Um, it's, it's, it seems like a commodity that you have to have. But every company intrinsically runs on IT now, to the core. And some, we have some big accounts that are like, out in Mayaka, doing stuff in wetlands. Like, it, they're not high-tech companies, but they are. Their systems are automated, they have robotics, it's all IT. Um, and, they, and, and when businesses really want to get it right with IT, they stop thinking of it as, okay, well, what's the IT we have to spend this year, right? And we help all our clients budget, what do I have to spend? What machines do I have to replace? What operating systems do I have to upgrade? The people that I see that get IT really, really well and really enjoy it and, and, and get the most out of it and get a return and it really feeds their business, view it more as a, what should we invest in IT so that we can be better than the competitors and get ahead and it's a tool. And they start to pivot towards, I'm not gonna run my laptop six years, I'm gonna run it four because every extra minute it takes my estimator and my CAD design person, whoever it is, to do that eventually I'm, there's, it becomes a diminishing return to run an old machine. And uh, we see it, we track, man, I, I'm an accountant at the core, spreadsheets, we track mountains of stats to make us efficient and good so that we can be proactive and then help our clients as best as possible. And what I mean by that is we track tickets by client, by user, by type for IT issues, just mountains of data on what does my technical team spend time fixing, right? And you can see in the businesses that invest more in their IT every year that they have way fewer issues on their networks, with their users, with their, just everything across the board. And it's because computers are machines and they're just like cars. The longer you drive a car, the more times it breaks down. And then they'll look at us and be like, fix it. And I'm like, well, of course we can fix it. And of course we can try to keep it running. We'll change the oil, do all that. But if it gets old and, and you don't invest enough in it, you're driving an old car. I drove my car, it totals 200,000 miles. I knew the diminishing returns at the end. I'm gonna have to see the mechanic once a quarter. It's gonna be interrupted to my day, but I'll trade that on and eventually I wouldn't buy a new car. Because I'm an accountant, it's really cheap. And, and people get like that with their computers. And the problem is, um, so you say how much to invest. I'm like, you need to look at it as what is gonna make my business competitive and really, really operate well. And from a security standpoint, and make sure that I don't end up in a situation too easily. Make yourself a hard target. But I don't know what percent it would be, specifically of contractors. I could probably go look at some numbers. I mean, we, we track all that and I could see, um, but I think you need to invest enough that IT is not a thorn in your side. It's something that you do well. And people seem to know when that is, right? Because they stop complaining about IT and they start getting productivity out of it. And, and it's, it's, it's a fine line. You don't want to overspend. There's no point to overspending. But 
has to be something that you know is pivotal to your business. Good question. Right. Yeah, if you have like one or two tips um, for somebody who already does a little bit of this kind of proactive stuff, like how you turn on two-factor authentication for my Gmail and using LastPass to generate random passwords and set up new accounts, what is the kind of the next step that I can do to protect myself on the personal side? Because I'm, I'm, I'm worried about it on the corporate side. The client. Sure. Well, it sounds like you're doing a lot of things right. Um, I think is, I, I try to, on the personal, I try to really keep my wife up to speed, is what I do. Um, not, not because there's anything wrong with my wife or anything, of course not. She just doesn't live in the world I do. I get to go into an office every day with 60 engineers that live this. So I, I just absorb it, right, a lot of it. Um, she doesn't get to do that. And I don't come home and bore her with cybersecurity. Um, but you, you have to educate yourself, right? Because it changes. I could give you a tip today and it'll be different by next week. And so how do I try to, to stay relevant on it on a personal level? I read a lot. I, re I, I read these stories about the, the Colorado uh, city sending the money. I, I saw that and I literally stopped and read that article. I'm like, how did they do that? And I want to make sure that I know those. And that's both for my business, but it's also on a personal level. I don't want people on my stuff. I don't want my emails. I stopped my wife from doing banking on our older computers. At home, I said, don't do any online banking and, and financial stuff on these computers anymore. Why did I do that? Because my kids were now using these computers. And I was like, yeah, I don't trust them either. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't know what they're doing. And, and I've walked by and I'm like, don't do that on the internet. You can't just click on stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? And they do with your kids. And so there's a tip that I personally do that I don't think is written anywhere. It's like, I don't do any important computer work on a computer my kids and wife. Sounds weird to say that, but I have the privilege of living in a world with a bunch of smart people. Um, they don't. Right? Like, I come home and I, I So there, there's the one tip I would say is. Does she know this? Like, does she know there's a laptop? Like, <coughs> yeah, no, no, I told her. I said, stop banking on this one because the kids are using it extensively, and I just don't know if I have it buttoned down the way I should at home. Right? I know my office computer is really tight up, but my home computers, I don't look at them that often. I don't know if they're being perfectly patched, updated, unless I'm going to do it. I'm, and, and our technical team, I know they all go home to their families and they do it. I hear them talk about it. I was like, oh, I don't go home and work on computers. I'm not, I, never, I don't work on them in the office. So that's my one tip is everybody's personal computer at home is probably more vulnerable than their one in the office. Yeah, and our, our teenage kids probably know more than us about how oh, to navigate through all that stuff. So, uh, but they're very, I find that, they, that they're very uh, sharing, right? Yeah. They're very trusting. And the good news is they don't have a lot of <coughs> valuable stuff yet maybe that they need to protect, but we do. Um, and they're trusting. They're just very trusting the youth of the day. And, and not that I'm old and wise, but I'm like, man, I don't, I don't mind social media and stuff being shared, but I have a limit. Right? Like, I'm like, don't share everything. It just makes you an easy target. I get, I get emails that are targeted at me. They get by all the filters and everything, and I get probably one a month. It comes into my inbox and looks like it is for me from something that I interact with, an association, um, some sort of electronic signature, someone I did business with in the past that's not a client anymore. Um, and they are so good and you get, you, I get one a month. It's, it's ongoing and you really have to be, and it sounds like you guys are all very diligent about it, but, but just be wary, they get better and better. The more important you are, they get, they get more strategic too. Big email chain. So, so there's one more question that's been burning in my mind, and that is the Apple world and the PC world have always been kind of close to each other, and now a lot of us have uh, a Surface and an iPad and an iPhone and a PC on our desk. I mean, is there a vulnerability in the jumping back and forth between uh, cultures of computer world? I, I don't know that there's one going, the, an additional risk created by using multiple, but I will say that, that from what I've heard at the conferences in the past couple of years, the speakers, the experts that are much deeper than me in the industry and on a global scale, is that all of the platforms are vulnerable and can be compromised. There's always a, a lot of talk historically about how, how the Apple platforms and stuff are more secure, and, and I think maybe to some degree they were, right? You could debate that forever, but what's clear in the last couple of years is that they're not, you know, 
a platform that's not going to be compromised. They're targeted, they all are. I don't know that you create additional risk by using multiple platforms, but I do think it's important to know that if you're operating under the assumption that I run Apple's and it won't happen to me, that's not true anymore. And that, that's from like the FBI and stuff. People, they're like, no, nope, that doesn't The reason you don't see it as much is because you don't have as many Apple's out there in the business world. You just don't. Yeah. The applications don't run on Macs, so people don't buy Macs, they buy PCs. So all of the bad guys are targeting PCs. That's why you see it more. But it's not that the Apple ones couldn't be compromised. There's just no money in it. It's not enough volume. Great. Any other any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. yeah. I got one more question. All right. I like to keep all my servers right next to me rather than on the cloud. What is your opinion on that uh, process? That's a good question. I um, I thought it was funny right next to you. Like, man, you're really watching. <laughs> right next to me, office next to me, where the servers are, where we have our routers, you know. Yeah. And everything, and, and uh, we have the uh, control reports yep. for people who can in and work from home. And uh, I just feel more comfortable that way versus having all my data in the cloud. And I, uh, I've, I've been told that I'm crazy for doing it that way, but I just like to know what your yeah, I, I don't know that you're you're crazy for, for thinking that. I think a lot of people think that. Um, so what, what do we see, right? What, what actually works and what do we see? I could give you my personal opinions, but I'd rather just stick to what actually goes on. I, I, what is your personal my, my personal opinion is, I, is I'm not afraid of the cloud. I, I'm really not. I'm, I'm, I think that if you do it right and you put the security tools in place while you're using the cloud, two-factor authentication, complex passwords. You want to talk about something my wife hates, the passwords that we have on every account. Right? Like, they're incredibly difficult, and I don't memorize them. They're in password tools. And but if you use the cloud in that way, I'm not. I personally am not scared of it. Um, I keep everything that I have offline. It's backed up in the cloud. My neighbor's house a month ago burned to the ground. A horrific fire. Like 20 fire trucks show up in our neighborhood one night. Burned to the ground. Like you hear about those stories happening. It happened like just down the street from me. They lost everything. Everything like just burned to the ground. So I up, I back up my photos online. I um, I save everything online. My passwords are in it, but but all of my access is two-factor authentication into any email account. It's going to hit my phone. Any security measure that I can turn on with any bank account, with any email account, with any Dropbox, I have them all turned on. Like if you log into one of my things from a different computer, myself included, it's going to light up a bunch of phones and stuff. That's what I do, and you don't have to be super high tech to do that. You just have to be patient enough to do it. And people hate security because the more secure something is, the harder it is to work with. And I bite that bullet. I turn it all the way up. And I, I do it because I think then I can trust the cloud. So back to, back to the question more from a business case. Um, what we see is, is hybrid. More and more companies are moving more and more things to the cloud. It's very secure. You have a server in your office. Um, physically, that's probably more risky now that, that something is going to physically happen to it, like a fire, damage, water, kicked, stolen. If it's in the cloud, it's the same operating system and server. It's literally just in a different room. Think of it that way, but it's the same server. You have to button it down the same way, same password, same security, but it's the same server. If your server in your office is on the internet, you're potentially the cloud for someone else, right? That, that's all it is, computers in different locations. And we have had clients that have brought us in and we deploy our tools, they're a new client, and our scanning systems will pick up something that's been sitting on their network, on their server, using that for years. Maybe not for money, but they're downloading stuff there and sending it off. They're using them as Amazon Cloud or Microsoft Azure Cloud. They're just using your server. I'm not saying that's happening. What I'm getting at is the cloud is just computers in different locations. So it doesn't scare myself and our clients do this a lot. It really depends on what is best for your business operations. Sometimes your cloud computing doesn't work because of the applications you're running, high-end CAD, stuff like that. You gotta have it local because you need a mountain of processing and you can't be relying on the internet. But we look more at the business case. What makes sense to put in the cloud from both a risk and cost? And what makes sense to just have right in your office? But there's risks with both. Like we see the physical risks come up. He, David talked about a disgruntled employee deleting files, you want to know what's worse? You dump a cup of water on your server, right? On the way out, right? Now they're all deleted for you, and, and it doesn't work anymore. So 
we, when we go through that annual risk assessment with our clients, we talk about where they physically have their server. Like, is it in a locked, air-conditioned, ventilated room? Of course, many of them aren't, right? But we tell them with when, if and when you're remodeling this office, call us, that will be part of the plan. And our clients slowly do it as they can. But I, we're not scared of the cloud, and I think a hybrid environment where some stuff's in the cloud, backups, 365, and then some stuff might be local, either security or domain control, maybe your primary application. We see that a lot. It's pretty normal. Not everybody's 100% in the cloud, not everybody's has to be on-premise. I think I, I felt the same way that I'd as about how, you know, you, you lose control. And yeah. a lot of the software vendors for business software, like for us, for engineering, for drafting, for example, you know, it used to be you would buy the software, it would live on your machine, and you controlled it, and you didn't have to update it if you didn't want to. And it seems like they've all changed to a subscription model. So they're yeah. forcing you to be virtual because you know they don't even give you the disk anymore. You know, They'll so all be that way shortly. Yeah. There's very few of us that aren't going to be forced into a subscription. But if they go under, then you lose your data. Yeah. So It's interesting because then you pay the subscription, and then, and then what we're having to see and do now is, is um, pay for a backup to the application that's in the cloud just so you can sit there and try to keep the data should they go out of business or you want to switch. Yeah. Rob, you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to mention to you something from the insurance side that we've seen an uptick in folks getting hit on directing their payroll company where oh, yeah. somebody's in paychecks. In. Yeah. Well, it's and others. No, no, no. I mean like their paychecks yeah. are being direct deposited into a different account. Exactly. Well, it's it's coming from the HR. There's They're stepping yep. in and first thing the HR giving the direction to whatever payroll company it is, and they're yep. not using the two-factor. Yep. And I, I think that's, the ones that are, aren't getting hit. It's the ones that are yeah. using the more simple. And proper program. authorizations, like you just can't rush through changing where money's going. I've seen three of those in the last four months. Yeah. So that, that were, that were effective. It's ones very gone. effective. And, yeah. and especially since some of those, the dollar amount might not be huge but it's so quick and easy for them that they'll still do it, and they'll do a bunch of them. Right. Especially once they'll they add employees, yep. I think, and, and add different you know, accounts. And if the email comes from yeah. someone that looks really good to HR, I put this in there, give them a bonus, it, and it's not a huge amount, a lot of times it goes through very quickly. Yeah, what was that movie where the, the guy in IT took all the half cents from everybody's paychecks and right. got a new right. car, remember? Yeah. Um, so I guess we're right up at our, uh, at our closing time. I uh, hope we didn't scare you too much, but had some interesting stories and, and definitely appreciate y'all coming out here and yeah. you have any closing comments. No, just let us know if you have any questions. Um, take the handbook with you. I think, I think it's, the team did a great job putting this together. Um, and I think that I go, I go to a lot of sessions and training like this and, and you kind of forget about it when you go back, but put that in your filing cabinet. And then if, if nothing else, when it comes up for the quarterly, annually, biannually planning meeting, pull that out and say, I think we should try to implement some of this in the coming year and just take steps into it. And that's what we try to walk our clients through. So just start at the beginning, but um, just hang on to that hand up. Oh, data dump. So in there, there's a data dump for recycling all of your equipment properly and making sure it's secure and the hard drives are punched through. Um, bring all your old equipment, both personal and business, to those. We do those quarterly, and, and uh, it's a great way to get rid of all that technical stuff without dumping it on landfill, too. I don't have the date and time. It's on there. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.